All right, so um, we'll talk about how to use small angle X-ray scattering to study biomolecular phase separation. Um, and this is, a, you know, phase separation is a topic that my lab studies quite a bit. We focus mostly on, on study of phase separation. We're interested in how these biomolecular condensates themselves form. We often reconstitute simple versions of them in vitro. And then we're under, um, interested in understanding what the, um, the biomolecular interactions are that underlie their formation, how that may relate to function and disease processes. <clears throat> and so I'll give you a short introduction to phase separation. Um, of course, you know that um, cells, eukaryotic cells are um, extensively compartmentalized by membranes. And I'm only showing in this schematic here the nucleus, but of course there are lots of other membranes in cells. But it turns out that in addition to these membrane enclosed organelles, there are other so-called membrane-less organelles or biomolecular condensates, including nucleoli, nuclear speckles, and here stress granules and pea bodies in the cytoplasm. And um, really dozens of these kinds of um, biomolecular condensates. Um, I'm showing you a video of stretch granules here in cells. They have properties of liquid-like droplets with a surface tension, meaning the material is not miscible with the cytoplasm or nucleoplasm and re it resembles somewhat oil and water. That's a very simplified um, way of, of talking about it. And we'll talk about it in, in more precise terms. Um, but in fact, these uh, these condensates are formed via um, phase separation of proteins and often nucleic acids. When a solution undergoes phase separation, it demixes into a dense phase and a coexisting dilute phase. And this is mediated by a multivalent interactions that make a, a three-dimensional network that spans the condensates. The resulting droplets can fuse and wet surfaces, as you see here, and these processes have been studied extensively for simple homopolymers for decades. But over the last 10 years or so, it's really become clear that phase separation also extensively compartmentalizes cells. Um, and phase separation does not only mediate the formation of these membraneless organelles that I just showed you, but also assemblies in cells that haven't nece necessarily been thought of as compartments. Um, phase separation has been promoted to promote such processes as heterochromatin formation, the function of super enhancers, and perhaps other um, processes in transcription, um, RNA metabolism, membrane receptor clustering, and even in processes that shape membranes, such as autophagy and endocytosis. <clears throat> what are the functional benefits of phase separation if it's so ubiquitous in cells? Um, colleagues and I put together this initial repertoire of cellular functions mediated by phase separation based on what was reported in the literature here in 2019. And um, this naturally includes localizing certain molecules to certain parts of the cell, um, sensing of stresses coupled to a fast biophysical um, response instead of a slow transcriptional response. Also, inactivation of processes by sequestering important molecules into a dense space or activation, sorry, activation of processes by concentrating the important molecules in one space to a high concentration and then driving these, these processes. And a few other, others here, I just wanted to point these out so that you get an idea of why we think phase separation is important. So if um, phase separation is such an important process, then you know um, it, it's worth um, looking at it more closely and understanding the underlying biophysics, right? And I think it, it really promises um, to explain the biophysical basis of a lot of fundamental biological processes. And this is why we are interested in understanding how phase separation is encoded in proteins and, and what the um, mechanisms are for the formation of condensates, how they look inside, and what kind of functions they can they can um, mediate. So we really need a quantitative framework for phase separation of biomolecules. And I'll um, give you a little bit of background here of phase separation of let's say of two component systems. So we have a biomolecule. It could be a protein. It could be an RNA. Um, um, but let's say you're a protein in solution, and we 
um, here in the schematic, we increase the protein concentration from left to right in these discrete steps. And then you see below a phase diagram in which we also have um, the concentration on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have some sort of parameter like temperature, pH, salt concentration that modulates the strength of the interactions between these molecules and therefore shapes that phase diagram. All right, so below the so-called saturation concentration, we have a soluble, we have soluble protein in solution. So the way we typically think about protein solutions, a homogeneous solution, right? But once we cross that threshold concentration, the saturation concentration, then we'll see two phases, a dense phase that is rich in protein and a dilute phase that also has protein molecules uh, within them, but at a lower concentration. And we see this here in the phase diagram. So we are at, at point one, we have a homogeneous solution. And once we cross that black line, the coexistence line to go into the two phase regime, we'll always see two different phases. And um, um, the, the saturation concentration or the dilute phase concentration is always gonna be the same. And the dense phase concentration is always gonna be the same if we keep the same solution conditions, temperature, pH, and so on. It, no matter how much total protein concentration we have. So if we increase the total protein concentration, we'll just get um, more dense phase, so larger um, uh, or more droplets. Um, and if we increase the protein concentration all the way to 0.4 here, we even have more dense phase than dilute phase. So it will look like we have dilute phase droplets inside a dense phase. And if we walk out of that two phase regime here again by crossing the coexistence line on the other side, then we'll have one phase again. We're back in the one phase regime, just that that one phase will now be denser than the dense phase. And you know, this is more of a, um, of a, um, uh, of a concept rather than that we see that very often, right? Um, so, this chi parameter here that, that says how strongly something phase separates, um, it's really about the balance of protein-protein, protein-solvent, and solvent-solvent interactions. And so if the protein-protein interactions are very fa favorable, then uh, we get phase separation. And this is a mean field parameter here. So it's just about overall the protein chains like to interact with each other more than with the solvent. But of course, when we think about proteins, we think about more specific interactions, right? So how does that work practically? Well, we understand the phase behavior of multivalent domain motif type systems very well, like this protein containing repeats of SH3 domains and interacting with a binding partner with repeats of binding motifs for these SH3 domains. This is described in a seminal, seminal paper by Mike Rosen's lab. And when they interact, they form these large non-covalently networked complexes that have a lower solubility than the individual protein molecules. And these will thus demix from solution um, and form networked dense phases. But some intrinsically disordered regions can phase separate as well. As a quick reminder, intrinsically disordered regions are, um, are proteins that do not uh, adopt a unique folded structure but rather interconvert convert between different unfolded conformations. And these can be extended or compact, can contain some secondary structure or tertiary context. And these conformational properties are encoded in their sequence, as is their phase behavior. And so really, we're interested in understanding how is that phase behavior, whether uh, IDR can phase separate or not, encoded in their sequences. Um, and, um, it is much less well understood than for domain motif type systems, but I would argue that's because we don't know which parts of the sequence actually interact. And if we knew which parts interacted and we knew their interaction strength, then we would understand them as well as in these domain motif type systems. Because there we know the larger the number of interacting domains and the stronger their interactions are, the stronger is the driving force for phase separation. So we, um, use the stickers and spacers framework that my colleague uh, Rohit Papu has introduced to the, to, to the bimolecular condensate field from associative polymers. And we think of stickers as adhesive elements that form physical crosslinks with one, each, with one another that can be within a single chain 
so different parts of the chain coming together and forming a crosslink, or between chains. <clears throat> and then the rest of the sequence, we, we think of spacers that connect these stickers and influence their ability to interact with each other. And so we've been using this framework to think about phase separation of H and RNPA1. This is an RNA binding protein, which is important in alternative splicing and is also part of stress granules. And um, it has this very typical domain structure for a lot of RNA binding proteins, it has two folded RNA binding domains, these RMs, and a long intrinsically disordered sequence that we call a low complexity, a low complexity domain because it doesn't really make use of the full um, amino acid alphabet. It's really um, highly enriched in small polar residues like lysines and serines and asparagines, and then has a smattering of aromatic residues um, throughout the sequence and some, some charged residues. And um, um, a few years ago with Paul Taylor, we showed that it can phase separate and that the um, intrinsically disordered low complexity domain is sufficient for its phase separation. And so we've been using this really as a system to understand how phase separation is encoded in IDRs. Um, um, and, and one reason for that is that it shares these sequence properties with other types of IDRs, but also that it's um, a physiologically a relevant system and there are, um, is some um, um, disease relevance. So mutations in this disordered region lead to familial forms of certain neurodegenerative diseases, such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, and frontotemporal dementia. And such domains can also sometimes be fused um, in so-called fusion oncoproteins um, to DNA binding domains, and then lead to, um, to, to certain types of cancers. So we're really interested in how this domain encodes phase separation. And so we've been um, using the stickers and spacers framework, and we wanted to identify the stickers in the sequence that mediate these interactions. And um, we, we thought that the same interactions that drive intramolecular sticker-sticker interactions should also be able to drive intramolecular interactions, at least you know, if that if a protein is completely disordered. And in that way, it would be easier to study. And we could study just the dilute protein solution and identify these stickers. And so um, this has been a collaboration with Rohit Papu's lab and different people in my lab have contributed over the years. There are a few papers that I'll touch on, but I'll just pull out the most important concepts and especially focus on small angle x-ray scattering. So Eric Martin really drove the original work on small angle x-ray scattering and then together with Ivan Perrin in a paper and Alex Holhaus and um, Anna Blema and Wade Borchertz in my lab and Mina Frock in, in Brohut's lab have really carried on that torch and have done some really um, interesting follow-up work. So um, we've been using this combination of biophysical techniques, small angle x-ray um, scattering, especially co-flow size exclusion coupled small angle x-ray scattering, um, because the sequences, um, you know, they, they are aggregation prone. This is why they are tied to neurodegenerative diseases. They form um, um, solid fibrillar deposits in um, neurons of patients with, with these neurodegenerative diseases. And so we have to prevent um, aggregation in the samples, right? And we use um, size exclusion coupled small angle x-ray scattering for that. And then they are pretty small. This is 130 residues disordered, so it doesn't have a lot of contrast. And so to be able to use um, a high, um, um, high x-ray flux, we've been, uh, we started to use the co-flow systems when they become, became available at BioCath. And so um, that has allowed us to really get high quality small angle x-ray scattering data on this low complexity domain and lots of variants of it. And then we use, I think one of my plots here disappeared. <laughs> and then we use um, NMR spectroscopy because NMR provides um, information, um, atomic resolution information, even on these very intrinsically disordered and dynamic systems. Um, so let's see um, what we can learn from the SACS data. So we, um, we get um, protein eluting from the size exclusion column. We can um, see that the RG over that whole peak is pretty flat. We can thus analyze, you know, um, get, get a single 
um, Sachs curve over that whole profile and then analyze that. Here we're using a normalized Kratky plot. And here I'm showing you that um, depending on the expansion of this uh, intrinsically disordered region, we will get different looking um, uh, Kratky plots. And this tells us about the size um, of, of, those, uh, of those IDRs. And, and here is data of the wild type Asian RNPA1 LCD. And um, here is a uh, uh, radius of gyration. So what does that mean, right? Um, you, you don't have a lot of comparison here right now. But I'll tell you that um, we think about um, dimensions of intrinsically disordered region uh, really like polymers, where the radius of gyration depends, of course, on the number of monomers in the sequence, but then also here on the so-called scaling exponent. And that scaling exponent nu really reflects the solvent quality. Does the protein like to interact with solvent and therefore it's quite expanded, it opens up to the solvent. And that would be um, a scaling exponent above 0.5. If it's pretty, you know, um, if it doesn't really care whether it interacts with itself or with the solvent, it, 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 it is at the theta point and it has a scaling exponent of exactly 0.5. And if it likes to interact more with, with itself than, than with the solvent, the scaling, scaling exponent will be below 0.5. And these are also the cases where you either get um, a soluble protein with a scaling exponent above 0.5, or you'll get phase separation or some sort of aggregation with a scaling exponent below 0.5. And so to extract the scaling exponent, we've been using a method developed by Josh Ryback and Tobin Sosnick. Um, that um, developed a molecular form factor um, for the interpretation of SACS data of intrinsically disordered proteins. And so here you see that um, uh, how, how SACS curves or Kratky plots would look for IDRs with different types of scaling exponents and, um, and how that allows the extraction of, of these scaling exponents and, our, and, and dimensions of these proteins. So what we learned from that Sorry, my mouse is pretty temperamental here. Um, what we learned from that was that our um, disordered low complexity domain was quite compact, much more compact that had, than had been reported for other IDRs with a scaling exponent below 0.5, really indicating that also in the single chain dimensions, we should, could see that tendency to interact with itself and um, to phase separate. So, what type of residues mediate this, right? As I told you, we used NMR spectroscopy and I only touch upon that because um, this is a, a SACS workshop, right? But uh, we're measuring here relaxation of the protein as a function of the, or of, of residues as a function of the sequence. Um, and this tells us about the dynamics of the protein chain and these peaks here that were, the values are higher then what is expected for a completely disordered chain tells us that there are residues in the chain that interact with one another. And therefore they have um, slowed down dynamics. And these peaks point to the aromatic residues in the sequence. And we've been able to also show um, um, directly that these aromatic, aromatic residues interact with one another. And we can use that with so-called NOEs, nuclear overhauser effects. They show um, direct interactions in, in space. And well, the, the, the spectra are quite overlapped because in this disordered, in these disordered uh, regions, all of the aromatic residues kind of come in the, in the same place in the spectra. But we can see a difference between the phenylalanines and the tyrosines here in the spectrum, even if then within them, they are pretty overlapped. And so in this, in this so-called nosy spectrum, we see that there is an interaction between the phenylalanines and the tyrosines here. And if we sit here on the tyrosine um, um, resonance, we see an interaction to the phenylalanines. So that really confirmed that these aromatic residues can interact with one another. And then, in collaboration with Rohit and Alex Holhaus, um, or rather they worked on, on simulations um, of this uh, intrinsically disordered region. And they were able to see um, 
Well, first of all, the simulations fit our experimental SACS data very well, which made us um, think that we could um, use molecular interpretations um, of, these, of these simulations. And what they showed was that the aromatic residues were really the ones that made most um, many more contacts in the sequence than, than other residues. And if we look at this here, this spot shows um, all aromatic residues in the sequence as these kind of balls, and they are, are colored by their propensity to interact with each other. So the darker the color, the more other aromatic residues this residue interacts with. And you see that they these are not just specific pairwise interactions, but basically all aromatic residues can interact with one another. It's a little bit less at the termini due to steric reasons. All right. Now the question was, um, are they interacting with each other so strongly because they are sticky and the chain is compact, or are they causing compactness of the chain? Right. And to test this, we made variants of um, the LCD where we uh, mutated. Um, where we're, we, we removed one third or two third of the aromatic residues or added another third of aromatic residues. And we used small angle x-ray scattering again and looked at the radius of gyration or the scaling exponent and saw indeed that the higher the number of aromatic residues, the more compact was the protein. And this really showed us that these, um, these aromatic residues are the stickers and they give rise to cohesive interactions that determine the chain dimensions. All right, so what, so, so, so Sachs has helped us to identify that the aromatic residues are the stickers, right? What else can we do with these data? Well, we use them to the combined data from these different mutants to um, determine interaction strengths of stickers with stickers stickers with spacers and spacers with spacers. Because, you know, depending on how strongly in they interact, that will determine the chain dimensions, right? And um, <clears throat> here you just see that the experimental RGs and um, a, prom a parameterization of this model um, are in good agreement. And, and this allowed um, Alex and Rohit to um, to parameterize this lattice-based coarse-grained model that uses a single bead per residue. And we only have stickers or spacers in the sequence, right? At every position where we have an aromatic residue, we have a sticker with a certain interaction strength that comes out of our experiments and all of the other residues are, um, are spacers. And then they can um, put many chains um, into a box and do simulations with these parameters. Um, and um, they can simulate the, the phase behavior of these chains. We see here that the wild type phase separates pretty strongly, right? The era minus less so. Play this again. There, oh, it's not playing. There's, um, there are some more chains in the dilute phase. So the, the, the concentration that requ is required to first get the droplets is, is higher. And here the era minus minus doesn't phase separate under these conditions. All right. And then these, um, these simulations can also be done as a function of, um, of temperature. And that then allows the extraction of um, dense phase and dilute phase concentration as a function of temperature, which means we get phase diagrams, right? And so here we see the simulated phase diagrams um, indicated by circles um, and compared to experiment, um, and they are in very good agreement. What they can also, sorry, what they can also um, show us is that um, the higher the sticker valence, the larger is the driving force for phase separation. If we look here at a given temperature, a lower concentration of the era plus variant is required to hit that coexistence line than of the wild type, than of the era minus. Right? So this has a stronger driving force for phase separation than the wild type than the error minus. And we also see why we never saw phase separation of the error minus minus experimentally, because its critical point above which there is never phase separation, its critical point is below freezing. All right. Um, so the higher the sticker valence, the larger is the driving force for phase separation. And that was um, one of the conclusions from this paper. 
Stickers in the low complexity domain can be identified in an unbiased manner from experiments on dilute samples. That makes it much easier than having to look in the dense space. Um, aromatic residues act as these stickers that mediate distributive cohesive interactions, both intra and intramolecularly. And what I didn't show you, um, um, but that was also in the paper, these aromatic residues are linearly distributed in the sequence. And that is important for giving rise to these dynamic um, liquid-like droplets. If we, um, we um, put them all together in like clusters, then we got a different kind of phenotype of more aggregation than uh, forming liquid droplets. All right. So what this also showed us was that we could use the single chain dimensions of the protein molecules to get information on their driving force for phase separation, right? And we, we asked whether that is in general the case. And so um, we made a lot more sequences. Oops, my mouse is not showing up here. We made a lot more sequences um, where we, we um, cha uh, changed um, aromatic residues in more diverse ways. We, we altered charged residues added or, re or removed charged residues, positively and negatively once, and both of them. And then we, um, we measured small angle X-ray scattering, and of course, driving force for phase separation. And I'm just going to show you this from the perspective of small angle X-ray scattering now. Um, first of all, all of these variants had scaling exponents below 0.5, really showing that all of them like to interact with themselves. right? And what I can also tell you is that um, um, all of them, except one, phase separated. So there's one variant here, this minus 10R plus 10K from our whole set that we didn't get to phase separate um, experimentally. All of the other, and, and you know, we tried to a uh, protein concentration of two millimolar or so, and it, it, it didn't phase separate. All of the others were accessible. We, we were able to, to, to um, determine their saturation concentration. So this is in pretty good agreement with the fact that we have these low scaling exponents that indicate they like to interact with each other, right? Um, as I said, we, we had some more aromatic variants. Originally, we had been looking at the variant with um, where, where we changed the number of aromatic residues. Now we mutated all um, aromatic residues to either tyrosines or um, phenylalanines. Ah, oh, no, these are the ones, sorry, I, I, I need to think about what exactly I'm, I'm looking at. Um, yes, so, so so here we mutated all um, phenylalanines to tyrosine so that we only had tyrosine residues in, as the aromatic residues in the sequence. Here, all phenylalanine residues to tyrosines. And this was a mutant where we removed some, some residues throughout the sequence. And although now we are changing the balance of tyrosines and phenylalanines, we had kept them constant in the previous paper, we still see this good relationship between the compaction of the chain and the driving force for phase separation that we're expressing here as um, a function of the saturation concentration, right? So really telling us that yes, um, the chain dimensions of these of these sequences really report on their driving force for phase separation. And here we we added a few more um, aromatic um, mutants. Um, but um, then we looked at our charged uh, variants and there it looked a little bit different, right? So now there doesn't seem to be a very good correlation. The uh, red line is the fit that we had from the aromatic variants. And clearly um, it doesn't explain the driving force for phase behavior of these, of these charged variants. But what we also saw in the context of this paper was that the charge of the overall sequences was very important for the driving force for phase separation. And we explained this in a way to say, you know, um, it's not only the ability to network to make these um, contacts between stickers, but it's also the charge, the net charge per residue of the sequence that determines its solubility. Similar to globular proteins, where we know that um, the pH, if we're at the pH of the PI of the sequence, then the proteins are at least soluble. If we go away, 
from the pi with the ph of the solution then the proteins are more soluble right so if we are at a net charge per residue of zero with this sequence then they are least soluble and if we um, have a, um, a, an absolute value of the net charge per residue, then the, the samples will be more soluble. And there are some intricacies to this. This is not an experimental saturation concentration. That's a re, uh, rescaled saturation concentration. And you can either ask me about it or, or look into our paper. But basically, be, because um, uh, we saw this, this relationship with the net charge per residue, we wondered whether there was a net charge per residue thing going on here with our global dimensions. And indeed, if we looked at the residuals of um, these measurements from our aromatic fit, then we saw again this type of V-shaped plot where we had a minimum close to zero as before. And um, so, so perhaps, um, the net charge per residue was really important for understanding the relationship of the global dimensions with the driving force for phase separation. And indeed, if we took the net charge per residue into account and uh, renormalized our, uh, our saturation concentration here, then we could indeed explain, um, we, we could indeed have a good correlation between saturation concentrations and these global dimensions. And so understanding this really allowed us to um, to, to extract, again, sticker-sticker um, interactions for, for all of these sequences. Okay, so overall, then, we come to a, um, to a way of thinking about phase separation of these intrinsically disordered regions that there are um, several um, hierarchies. There is networking through the sticker-sticker interactions, and we have different sticker strengths. For example, the tyrosine is stronger than the phenylalanine. And um, arginines can also make contacts with aromatic residues, but lysine residues actually interfere with their interaction. And I didn't show you that data, but it is in this paper. Then there is um, contribution from solubility. I told you briefly about the net charge per residue. We have a low absolute net charge per residue that, mediate, that, that, uh, that allows um, interaction of the, the stickers and, and strong coupling to phase separation. If we have high net charge per residue values, then that mediates solubility. And the um, spacer residues, also something that we looked at in this paper, um, have an influence. The smaller they are, the better can the stickers interact with, with one another. And if they're um, really big and they really like to interact with the solvent, like charged residues, then they expand the chain and prevent phase separation. And um, from all of this data, um, uh, Rohit and Nina, a student in Rohit's lab, have been able to extract um, additional sticker-sticker and sticker-spacer interaction strengths. Um, and and um, they have been parameterizing a, a, an advanced um, stickers and spacers model here that allows us to simulate the space behavior. And um, this is in very good agreement with experimental data for a large number of these kinds of sequences with all sorts of different flavors. We can make all sorts of different um, mutations and we can explain the face behavior very well. Okay, and now I have perhaps um, a few more minutes left and that should be totally fine to talk about the last topic I wanted to bring up and that's kinetics of face separation. Of course, we are not only interested in the thermodynamics of phase separation, what the equilibrium values are of um, concentrations at, at which we get phase separation for the concentrations in the dense phase. We're also interested in how quickly we actually um, assemble condensates and how we understand that process, right? That's important in cells. Um, stress granules form and they are um, dissolved again and how quickly can that actually happen? And of course, we're not looking in cells, we're looking at um, simplified systems in vitro, but so that we can understand the underlying concepts. And so here, um, Eric uh, Martin, when he was in my lab, did um, rapid mixing time resolved small angle um, x-ray scattering experiments in which a, a, a solution of the protein without salt, where it's highly, highly soluble, so you see here 1.6 millimolar um, HNRNPA1 LCD, and that was rapidly mixed, sorry, 
that was rapidly mixed with a salt solution um, so that the final solution was in an area of the two-phase regime. So we would expect that at equilibrium, this uh, protein solution would phase separate. But then we um, did small angle electroscattering scattering experiments um, as soon as 60 microsecond after mixing. And of course, that's sensitive to changes in the global dimensions on angstrom length scales. Right? And so here we're seeing what the response is. So here we have um, fully mixed protein. Um, and um, we actually see that the dimensions start um, becoming smaller um, up to at about four millisecond or so. And then the dimensions start going up again. Um, if, if instead we're looking at a mutant that um, where two thirds of the aromatic residues are removed. And I showed you this mutant at some point where we didn't see phase separation experimentally because we know the critical point is below freezing. So this mutant cannot phase separate under these conditions. And then we see no changes. There's no um, compaction of the protein on this time scale or on longer time scales. And so we already see a difference in the behavior of these two different protein um, sequences after a fraction of a millisecond, right? The sequence that will phase separate collapses. And that is because under these salty conditions, it is usually very compact because it makes these sticker-sticker interactions. But we're starting out without salt, right? And so it's more expanded, it's soluble. We're mixing it very rapidly. And then we see that it needs some time to respond to this. And on a millisecond time scale, it, it um, it contracts and then it starts assembling. And actually I'm gonna show you here like three um, uh, SACS profiles from different time points. So this is the earliest time point, looks like a disordered chain after two milliseconds when we're down here at mo some of the most compact points, it still is disordered, right? There's no partial folding going on or something like this. It's just a disordered chain that compacts via these aromatic, aromatic interactions. And then um, later when it starts assembling, we, we, we see here that now this is not just expanding as a single chain again, but that several chains are coming together. And then we also looked at this on, um, on somewhat longer time scale with a different mixer. Um, this is a laminar flow mixer here now. And so we can measure phase separate or, or the, the size of assemblies on longer time scales. And we're doing this again here as a function of salt concentration where salt works in the following way in this sequence that if we have um, the same protein concentration but we have a little bit of salt, we're just dipping into the two phase regime and we're slightly promoting phase separation. And the higher the salt concentration, the stronger is, is phase separation. And so what we see here, we're going from blue to red, or from short times to longer times. And if we look, for example, here at 200 millimolar salt, there's perhaps a tiny little bit of assembly, but we don't get overt assembly that becomes larger and larger the longer we wait. But for example, at 300 millimolar salt, we get um, pretty good assembly. And the higher the salt concentration, the faster is the assembly. And that's what we would expect also, that um, the stronger the driving force for phase separation, the faster is nucleation and growth into the, into the final condensates. And there was um, uh, some other data in that paper um, also with other methods. But basically, the um, overall uh, model that we came to was that um, when we dip these um, quench these intrinsically disordered chains into um, the salty buffer in which they phase separate, they contract, and then they start assembling. But then we actually saw that um, there, there is some barrier to, to assembly and that they don't really like to make these first, um, these first assemblies. And only once we go above a certain size, a certain nucleus, do we get um, um, nice and, and um, facile assembly into these droplets? So overall, SACS is useful for characterization of phase separation. And I hope I was able to show you that. 
I want to um, have two more slides in the end to tell you more about how, how that makes us think about phase separation overall. I showed you that we have these sticker sticker interactions by aromatic residues. But if we don't have disordered chains, we have domain motif type systems, multiple SH3 domains, interacting with a protein with multiple proline rich motifs or other types of systems. We can think about them in the same way as stickers and spacers that make contact with each other and they are connected via disordered sequences. So we have this network of, um, um, of chains in here. There's a condensate spanning network that's enabled by physical crosslinks of stickers. But that networking alone is not enough, because if we only had networking, uh, if we only had networking, we could grow that network more and more. But that wouldn't mean that we'd get a separate dense phase droplet and a coexisting dilute phase. So that networking is coupled to a density transition that results in these two phases. And so we call this actually phase separation coupled to percolation. I've really gone away from calling it liquid-liquid phase separation because that implies that both the dilute and the dense phase are liquid, pure, purely liquid. And this dense phase here is a network fluid. And network fluids are typically viscoelastic, like the kind of silly putty that, that you know that can flow when you pull it slowly, right? Or break and behave like a solid, an elastic solid if you pull it quickly. And that de depends on the rearrangement times of the um, of the interactions within within that material. And you know, the condensates don't behave exactly like silly putty, right? But they're also viscoelastic network fluids with viscoelastic properties. And, and this is something that we're working on. And so overall, then we, we think of the following things as important in these types of condensates. They, um, uh, the interactions happen with, a, with certain lifetimes and that determines the material properties of the condensates. Um, how the multivalent interactions are encoded in the sequence determines the network structure, how these things come together, and that must determine the biochemical properties of the condensates. The interfaces have different properties than the bulk, and, and so they are probably very important for mediating biochemical reactions and also disease processes. And um, something we didn't talk about in a lot of detail, but you can probably imagine these multivalent interactions that mediate the formation of the condensates also lead to the formation of small complexes um, um, before there are condensates and also coexisting with condensates. And they can, of course, also mediate biochemical um, reactions. And with that, I'd like to end and acknowledge people in the lab who did the work. Um, here on this photo, this is a newer photo. Um, neither Eric nor Ivan are on there, but we have Anna and Wade who have really been doing a lot of the recent work um, on decoding driving force for phase separation of these IDRs. Um, collaboration with Rohit Papu, Mina Farak, Alex Holhaus, of course, when he was in Rohit's lab, Andrea Serrano, Peter Schuck, um, Paul Taylor, Kristen Lindorf Larsen, and of course, you know, many, many thanks to um, APS, and Biocat, and Jesse, and Srinivas when he was there. And um, thanks for funding, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. <laughs>